If you enjoy these programs, please like and subscribe. I don't even know when the first time I was told that I was responsible for killing Jesus by some Catholic kids, and I was just shocked. So James, you want to start us off with uh, with that commercial you want to tell us all about. What's going on with that? Well, I, the, well, I figure if, uh, we've got uh, Rabbi Singer right here. We might as well go right for the heart of the matter in terms of the uh, uh, Tanakh prophecies that are so badly misused by Christians. And the one that, uh, you know, there's a commercial actually running in the United States right now in which uh, person who claims to have been converted from Judaism to Christianity uh, makes a pitch for the suffering servant prophecy in Isaiah, Isaiah 53, 54, um, uh, to remind viewers this is the this person who is to be pierced for the transgressions of people who stands silent, who's, who's uh, guiltless, but uh, uh, takes the terrible punishment. Um, and that is one of the most frequently used par uh, parts of the Tanakh by Christians to demonstrate that Jesus, as described in the Gospels, is the fulfillment of messianic prophecy in Isaiah. And uh, it, the commercial is running quite widely, and, and, and it, the person makes it seem as though it, it's some sort of revelation. All you have to do is go read Isaiah, and you'll see that uh, the Jesus of the Gospels is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. And he seems to think it's a messianic prophecy, which I'm not sure the suffering servant is at all, but I am dying to hear Rabbi Singer's view of this. You know, James, is a very good point. So as it turns out, uh, it's very important if someone wants to remain a Christian to just read Isaiah 53. That's what you want to do. Here's what you don't want to do if you want to be a Christian tomorrow. Don't read Isaiah 41, 42, 43. Don't read the chapters that introduce it. Don't read the whole book of Isaiah. Because if you read the whole book of Isaiah, so... I'm just going to point out the verses quickly, 41, 8, and 9, 42, 6, 43, 10, 44, 1, 21, 45, 4, 48, 20. You can see where this is going. This is the fourth of four servant songs. No matter what you believe, it's um, axiomatic that the author Isaiah had in view that if you're reading Isaiah 53, you've read the chapters that introduce it. So if you are watching me right now, listening to my voice. If you want to remain a member of your church in good standing, do not read Isaiah 41, 8, 9. Don't read Isaiah 49, verse 3, where it says explicitly that Israel is God's servant. Don't read Isaiah 48, verse 20, Israel's God's servant. Just read Isaiah 53. So this is a like a helicopter theology where you just land in the 53rd chapter of a 66-chapter book. So when, when I went to yeshiva, when I went to Jewish school, when I went to rabbinical school, we, we learned the whole book of Isaiah. In fact, I'm, I'm teaching the book of Isaiah here in Jerusalem. Uh, it's on YouTube. So if you read it in context, you, the servant is Israel, and those who are speaking in the 53rd chapter are the Gentile kings of nations. And they're astonished because, as it turns out, the end of days, uh, Israel, God's servant, is vindicated. So and one just one caveat about the book of Isaiah— you both know this. The book of Isaiah is not like other books. It's almost all poetry, a very exquisite poetry, Prob possibly the best example of biblical poetry in all of the Hebrew Bible. Out of 66 chapters, only six of them read anything like Joshua using standard prose. That means it's almost all using, almost all of Isaiah is using this very dense biblical poetry. When I say poetry, I don't mean Shakespearean poetry, but it's symbolic. So therefore, when you have, so you could theoretically open up the book of Joshua and just go to chapter 5 and read it and get a sense of what's going on. Joshua's encountering an angel, and you could get away with reading that out of context. You could read Leviticus 11 alone, and out of context, 
you could figure out which animals are clean and unclean because there's no poetry in these chapters. Isaiah is almost all poetry, and therefore it's using it's almost always using figurative language. So if you read the chapters that are introduced, you know immediately Israel is in view here, not of all of Israel, but the righteous servant of Israel who's not one individual, but as Isaiah 43 verse 10 says, you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen. So the servant is God's witnesses, and that's that's what's going on here. So again, if you're a Christian, you want to stay a Christian, just stay with 53 and Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 7, just those three chapters, you'll know that you should know them by heart, and you'll you'll stay in your church. If you read Isaiah 83 in context, be prepared to resign from your church tomorrow. <laughs> well, you bring up an outstanding point. It is highly poetic language, it is metaphorical language, and the suffering servant here actually is not any particular individual who's being uh, uh, predicted will come. It's a metaphor for the Jewish people as such. Right, right. And that brings up another, uh, uh, maybe the most widely used uh, prophecy from the Tanakh by Christians and widely misused prophecy from the Tanakh by Christians is Daniel's son of man prophecy. Hmm. And there again, it's always struck me that just like the other beasts that are being described, the image and the figure like a man is again a metaphor using picking up exactly what you, you're saying before is a metaphor for all of israel it's not simply uh meaning a particular human being like a messiah or a god man like a messiah jesus to come uh, would that be your take on daniel as well i think so i think you nailed it there um the the reason the word like is used is because this is a night vision seven thirteen. i believe this is the most quoted passage in the christian bible the, Jesus called the Son of Man, or said of him, or it's inferred that he's the Son of Man. I don't think any passage is, any clause in the Hebrew Bible is as quoted as frequently as this in the entire New Testament. So, right, so it's like a Son of Man because it's like a lion, early bear, um, leopard, and then, and this horrible thing. So, like a Son of Man here, I believe is speaking about the Messiah himself coming uh, to the with the clouds of heaven, the clouds of glory, to the ancient of days, and that's God. And then verse fourteen: all nations will serve him, and he will have that authority. So Daniel seven has brings into view four kingdoms that would subjugate the Jewish people: Babylon, Persia, Greece. Traditionally, Edom, Rome, that fourth beast that has 10 horns and 11 horn. And then you have the, the Messiah or Messianic ages. You, you're reading it, but the Messiah and, and then God's glory. And Daniel just shocked. And he turns back to the angel and goes, what is this fourth beast? Explain this to me. And then that comes to you as this, the, the worst thing of all. In Jewish tradition, that's Rome. Um, and christen them. Right. And so in effect, it's taking what is a what is a symbolic statement of the triumph of Israel and turning it for its own uses into Jesus of the Gospels. And as you point out, it's widely that phrase is widely used in the earliest Christian literature. Um, and it's sort of turning up the meaning of that prophecy, which is messianic and eschatological, but it's turning mm -hmm. the concrete meaning of it on its head. I, I just would add to this. Uh, Christians, if they thought about this, they would, it, let's say for a moment, if Daniel 7.13 is speaking about the Messiah, for those who don't know, Daniel 7 is in Aramaic. Um, if Daniel 7 is about the Messiah, that means Jesus can't be the Messiah. Could there be a greater proof that uh, the core tenant of the Christian religion is flawed than Daniel 7, because Daniel 7, 13 and 14, if it is speaking about the Messiah, it says there explicitly, 13 and 14, chapter 7, that all nations will serve him, and then his uh, sovereignty will be from one end of the world to the other, as we find in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10, not the coming in on a 
on a donkey into Jerusalem. That everyone knows who's in the Gospels. But verse 10, so most of the world does not believe in Christianity, most of the world. So it didn't happen. So can there be a greater proof that Jesus is not the Messiah than Daniel 7, 13, if we concede it all? Right. A very well taken point. Uh, you know, I think that these prophecies are used in early Christian literature extensively. For example, going back to the suffering servant, I think that the story of the trial of Jesus it surely reflects elements of it, but it, it seems to me that that story was modeled on Isaiah, not a fulfillment of Isaiah, uh, as the gospel writers are telling the story. And I think I'd go further with that, and I'm dying to get your opinion on this. Uh, I, Jacob hosted a conversation I had with Bart Ehrman, no less, and he agreed with me that the passion narrative in all four gospels is uh, a fiction, quite clearly, uh, but it is uh, allegorical, and it is, uh, in effect, a political allegory, blaming, attempting to blame collectively, uh, uh, astonishingly, uh, collectively the Jews for the death of Jesus, uh, and ex ex while simultaneously exonerating the Romans for what was clearly a Roman execution, crucifixion, a distinctly Roman form of execution. Um, and uh, the story, uh, all four Gospels, what they all share in common are certain similarities, the betrayal of Judas, the conviction by the Sanhedrin, Pilate declaring Jesus to be innocent in all four Gospels, and a Jewish crowd chanting for Jesus, insisting, violently insisting on Jesus' death, even in, in gospel, in Matthew's gospel, as if we needed the point, the crowd, I guess in unison, collectively says his blood is on us and on our children. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Professor Ehrman agreed with me that that's uh, political fiction designed to blame the Jews and exonerate the Romans for what is pretty clearly a Roman execution. Right, because and, and, as we can mark that, pun intended, the earlier, so all the four Gospels seek to exonerate Rome, Pontius Pilate, and seek to hold the Jews uniquely guilty for Jesus' crucifixion. And as you pointed out in Matthew 27, 25, the Jews say, crucify him, we take it upon ourselves and our children. And it's only in Matthew's um, passion narrative that we're introduced to Mrs. Pontius Pilate, who also thinks that that Jesus is completely innocent. But the, the, you could see the plot devices you pointed out, James, because of the four Gospels, the Mark, the earliest, is least anti-Semitic. All of them, it's a nightmare. All four, the Jews just do terribly. If you, like, you the viewer, like Jews and want to remain a philo-Semite, do not read the Gospels. Don't read the Passion narratives. We don't. We don't do well. <laughs> but Mark, Mark is the least bad, and John is the worst of all. I mean, the so the, increasing anti-Semitism right. literature. Right. And, and, yeah. So the paradox here is that they're using the Tanakh extensively, even if they have to reinterpret it, turn it on its head, misuse it pick things out of context. They're using the Tanakh extensively, and yet the, at the end of the day, what they have is a, in effect, a political religious message that is anti-Jewish, right. indeed anti-Semitic, and the foundation for future Christian anti-Semitism. Right. I think, I, I, I'm sure you'll agree, that, that I think at, that when Jesus, we're talking about the historical Jesus, when, when he was crucified, no one was thinking any of this. Uh, but I, I think, think what, what happens, happens is, is whoever thought he might have been the Messiah during his life, I don't know that anyone did while he was actually alive. Uh, it seemed the fact that no one knew who he was in Matthew 16, for example, except Peter, who that seems to be trying to explain that. So if no one thought that the Messiah is supposed to die and then he's crucified publicly, so after that event, people started thinking that he was the Messiah at some stage. And then they had to go back into the Hebrew Bible, scour it to find any verse that be, could be construed to point to a Messiah figure who would suffer and die. Very often misuse the text, or not only take it out of context, but change the meaning of words, like in Psalm 22, the crucifixion psalm, where we find uh, the cry of dereliction as an example. So that's what I think happened. I think you have a historical Jesus who actually was crucified, who 
publicly because of the Romans would have only done that because they thought that he was guilty of some form of insurrection. And then afterwards, people who – the early Christians at some stage said, we need to find passages in the Hebrew Bible if he's to be a Messiah Christ. Let's scour and find anything and then construe it to be pointing to a suffering Messiah. And that's what they did. I have to agree completely with you. Um, it's it's astonishing how modern Christians think of themselves as rooted in Judaism in an authentic way. You know, I've used I, I don't know I don't this is a joke I've used, but I think it may be overstating even the case. I've said that Christianity bears about the same relation uh, to Christianity bears about the same relation to Judaism that Taco Bell does to authentic Mexican food. But I think that even overstates the case. <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a Jewish joke, James. There's a, there's a Jewish joke. Why did God invent Mormons so Christians would know how Jews feel? And and Christians, as we know, bristle at the notion that the Church of Latter Day Saints are genuine Christians. That's exactly, if you're a Christian watching this, so think about the Church of Latter-day Saints. What do you think about them? Well, that's exactly what Christianity is to Jews, and that really is, it's really a parallel. You know, when, when, you, when you hear talk about the anti-Semitism, that the Jews control everything, and we control governments, leaders, and banks, and Hollywood, money, and the minds and thoughts of world leaders, where does that come from? Where do they get that idea? Th those ideas were not pervasive before the Christian religion. Th that's a, a that's made in Rome. That's a that's a Christian idea that's found in the Gospels that the Jews are uniquely responsible for Jesus' execution. It's impossible, and this is why I don't I understand Christian. It's impossible to read the Gospels, draw all stories and not draw that conclusion, unless anyone is not sure. Paul says in First Thessalonians, possibly the earliest uh, surviving Christian document, that the Jews are uniquely responsible for killing Jesus. And, he, and Luther wasn't crazy. The church fathers all stated that the Jews were responsible. They weren't nuts. They read the Christian Bible in plain reading. From Eusebius to Martin Luther, they're all saying that the yeah. Jew— this is the interesting thing, that the Jewish wars that were to come, the terrible wars that reduced the temple to the Wailing Wall, uh, people don't realize that. Uh, and what struck me in my own work was that it could be no accident that Christianity emerged at the very moment when there's this conflict between the Jewish people and the Roman Empire. It could be no coincidence. Um, and it struck me, looking at Christ Christian literature in that light, that what we're looking at are highly Hellenized, pro-Roman in their politics view. Mm. They may be have access to material like the Septuagint, but we're talking about educated elites who are writing a critical response to the Jewish rebels of the first two centuries. Right. It's, it's very striking how pro-Roman the Christian Bible is. It, it may shock viewers that there are iterations of Christianity that actually regard Pontius Pilate as a saint. And yes, that, yes. And that would— like how how the heck did that happen? But it can, it it can happen, and there was nothing wrong with Luther. Luther was it was a natural reading of the Christian Bible that drew Luther to conclude that the Jews were a demonic people, and he wrote about it not just at the end of his life, as most people think that he wrote it in, in the last few years of his life. His his literature, his commentary on the Bible, is riddled with anti-Semitism that comes straight from the Christian. Uh, straight from the Christian Bible. And right, the New Testament is so pro-Roman, not only exonerating Pontius Pilate, but in Paul in Romans 13, yeah. telling his readers to be loyal to the authority, not because it was pragmatic. That's, That's the right. mistake people make. They think that Paul is saying that in Romans 13, verse 1, because, well, you need to get along with the with the boss. We're living in North Korea. No, he says God put them there in place, and therefore rebelling against the Rome is a rebellion against God. Jesus, a not just a Roman, see, Jesus says right. of a centurion that he has more faith than anyone in Israel. Right. 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 Uh, right. And when you put it together with the 
uh, the obviously fiction structure of the passion narrative shared in all four gospels, the political motivation uh, becomes quite clear. And as you observe, there's an increasingly strident anti-Semitism mm -hmm. as Christian literature develops. It's there, I think, from the beginning with the passion narrative, I think, but increasingly anti-Semitic um, mm -hmm. material can be found, yeah. Right, right, it just, right. It just keeps intensifying to the point that in John 19, in this highly developed conversation between Jesus and Pontius Pilate, Jesus is not a quiet fellow as he is in Mark. Jesus says to Pontius Pilate, you're not responsible for this. He literally tells him, it's those who gave me over to you. It's their sins that is greatest. He explicitly says that in a highly well thought out conversation between him and Pontius Pilate. He says it, and he's given over to the Jews, not even to the Romans. So, right, John is, John is, if the book of Matthew and John had never been written, there would be many more Jews alive today. Alive today, I'm afraid. Right. I have to, you know, I come from a Christian background, sir, and my ancestors for the last thousand years have been Christians. But I have to agree with you, 100. It is the it is in the basic. Um, unfortunately, it's in the basic bone structure of the Gospels. I think mm -hmm. uh, this, and you can see during the Middle Ages they'd do passion play performances uh, in Europe, and it would routinely cause mob violence against the local Jews. Um, uh, it's mm -hmm. a despicable part of Christian history. Right. Look, as a kid, as a child in Brooklyn, you did not walk around um, Good Friday. That was not a good time for you. It was not a good time for Jewish people. So if you stayed in Borough Park, that was all Jewish. But if you stepped out and people are all amped up about, yeah, you, you were called a Christ killer. I mean, that... I mean, I was told that I don't even know when the first time I was told that I was responsible for killing Jesus by some Catholic kids, and I was just shocked. Of course, you know, I didn't have the guts to tell him. I wanted to tell him. I wasn't even in a neighborhood at the time. It seemed so preposterous to me that, but that was the charge. You killed Jesus, right? And I've been told that on the streets of Jerusalem. I have YouTube videos of Christians saying that to my face. And my response is, I want you to know that you are being loyal to the text. The text, you are conforming properly to Matthew 27, as you pointed out, James, one of the most grotesque uh, passion narratives where the Jews just say, we did it, and not only that, all generally. And you're right. That is a plain, natural reading of the text. And, and there are, of course, Christians who are very nice who say, no, it was only those Jews then, not Jews today, are not responsible for it. And the church said that in the Second Vatican Council, the Catholic Church. And I'm very happy they believe that, but that's not the natural reading of the text. Right. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> what well, was only in the 20th century <laughs> collectively right. forgave the Jews for killing Jesus, within our lifetimes. Our lifetime, right. Second Vatican Council is our lifetime. I was born in 1960. That was my lifetime. If you enjoy these programs, please like and subscribe. Thank <laughs> you.